Review time is the home for all things theme parks. Stay up to date with our videos by subscribing and tapping the bell icon. When Disney MGM Studios opened in May of 1989, guests immediately begged for more. The small half-day park featuring only two rides and a handful of shows was rushed to beat their rival Universal Studios Florida, but it was simply not big enough to match the demand of people wanting to add a third Disney theme park to their Floridian trip. Imagineers immediately got to work on expansions to the park including Star Tours and the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular, which would both open before the end of 1989. The next plans for the park would call for lands based on Mickey Mouse and the Muppets, but the biggest expansion plot was reserved for someone at the time almost bigger than Mickey himself. A blockbuster cartoon rabbit where in his land you would have stepped into the world of Toons. And taken a ride alongside that very rabbit in a roller coaster, transit bus, or even a baby buggy. For review time, I'm Luke, and this is a look at the cancelled Roger Rabbit's Hollywood. The designs for Disney MGM Studios originally began as a movie making and entertainment pavilion expansion for Epcot Center. But as the scale and scope of the project grew, these plans soon adapted into an entire third theme park for the Walt Disney World Resort. This park would quickly see itself approved and under construction as a thinly veiled preemptive strike against Universal Studios, who had plans to bring over their world famous studio tram tour from Hollywood into a brand new Floridian theme park. Rumors suggest that Disney's brand new CEO Michael Eisner had caught wind of Universal's plans and fast-tracked Disney MGM Studios in the hope of scaring Universal away from Orlando, when in fact all it did was scare Universal away from the tram tour idea and force them to redevelop the most well-known components of the tour into their own grand standalone attractions. On the 1st of May 1989, Disney MGM Studios would open to the public. Upon opening, the park would only have two shows, Superstar Television and the Monster Sound Show, as well as just two rides, The Great Movie Ride and the two hour long backstage studio tour, which would give guests a behind the scenes look at how films were made, on a back lot where almost no films were made. The park would feature working production facilities for film, television and animation, but they would mostly be used for Disney Channel original TV shows and a satellite animation studio for Walt Disney Feature Animation, where films such as Lilo and Stitch and Mulan were animated. The issues with Disney MGM Studios on opening day were apparent. Whilst guests loved what was on offer, they demanded more from the park which was originally conceived to only be a half-day experience. The immediate success of the park saw fast-tracked new attractions and expansions open almost immediately, with the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular in August of 1989, Star Tours in December of 1989, and Muppet Vision 3D in May of 1991, all helping to expand this half-day offering into a full-day experience. All of these also helped fill the glaring gaps that were opening up as Disney's attempts to turn Orlando into a movie-making destination simply didn't work. And the allure of touring working film production facilities doesn't quite shine when there are no productions underway. These shows and attractions were meant to be the first stage of expansion for the park, with a number of other large-scale projects in the works at the same time that truly would have made Disney MGM Studios a theme park destination. One of the biggest planned projects was a full Muppets expansion beside Muppet Vision 3D entitled Muppet Studios, the brainchild of a business negotiation where Disney would have acquired the Muppets, allowing Jim Henson to step back as a main creative consultant for the brand. This land would have essentially been a parody of the movie-making tropes seen elsewhere in the park, where Mama Melrose's Ristorante Italiano is today would have been the great Gonzo's 
Pizza Pandemonium Parlor, featuring displays of Muppet artifacts and costumes, and with food delivered directly to your table by animatronic rats on tracks above your head. Another food option next door would have been the Swedish Chef's Cooking School, where you would have watched the Muppet's head chef battle his ingredients whilst cooking you a delicious meal. The anchor of the land, though, would have been the Great Muppet Movie Ride, a spectacular dark ride of the in-production films the Muppets were producing. The ride would have been packed with special effects, humour and countless animatronics. Jim Henson described the experience as a backstage ride explaining how movies were shot, and all of the information is wrong. Sadly, Jim Henson would pass away before this project was completed, and lengthy discussions with his family about the rights to the Muppets dragged on for so long that by the time Disney did finally acquire them in 2004, the shine of the brand was nowhere near as strong as it was in the late 80s when the plans were officially cancelled. Elsewhere in the park would have been a Chicago Miniland featuring Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers taking guests aboard an enhanced motion vehicle on a high-speed chase through Chicago in one of Disney's most ambitious attractions of all time. For more information on this incredible-looking ride, be sure to check out our video on the failure of the Disney decade, where we talk about Crime Stoppers, as well as countless other cancelled Disney projects of the 1990s. Another planned expansion for the park would have been Mickey's Movie Land, this land would have been a replica of Disney's original Hyperion Avenue studio, where guests would encounter whimsical, hands-on movie-making equipment, where they could live out their own movie production fantasies. This land would have been placed where the Tower of Terror is today, at the end of a very different Sunset Boulevard, home to Mickey's Movie Land and Roger Rabbit's Hollywood, the largest planned expansion for the park. Roger Rabbit burst onto the scene in 1988 in the smash hit film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, loosely based off of the novel Who Censored Roger Rabbit. The film was an instant success, garnering critical praise and huge box office numbers. Eisner wanted to bank immediately on that success in the theme parks, creating a Roger Rabbit walk-around character and getting Imagineers to work on bigger, and grander projects featuring the new star. Roger Rabbit's Hollywood would have been located in the space that eventually became Sunset Boulevard, but would have been set in a more cartoonified version of that famous street, featuring real working trolley cars, grand pianos dangling precariously over the street, Roger-shaped holes in walls all over the place, and even a version of the terminal bar from the film. In the parcel of land currently containing Rock and Roller Coaster and Sunset Showcase would have been Maroon Studios, home to a number of Roger Rabbit attractions. Apart from the red trolley car transit system, the land would have featured four major attractions, including a simulator, a dark ride, and an incredibly wacky looking coaster. The first attraction in the land would have been the Toontown Transit System, a next-generation version of a simulator, featuring a full wraparound screen to fully immerse guests in the experience. The ride would have focused on Gus the Bus, a Toontown City bus that aspired to be an actor. During the ride, Gus would have found out that Maroon Studios was holding auditions, and by following Benny the Cab on a shortcut, guests would have fallen into the Toon River, sliding across rapids before diving underwater and being briefly swallowed by Monstro before crashing into Roger himself, creating a Roger-shaped dent in the roof of his bus. Roger was on his way to save Jessica from a burning fireworks building. Once you got there, a rogue firework would have crashed into the bus, sending you to space before landing right back in Maroon Studios at Gus's audition, where the dramatic entrance enthralled the director, offering him a movie contract on the spot. Toontown Transit would have been an incredible upgrade to a simulator-based attraction, popularised by Star Tours just a few years earlier. Ultimately, the plans for Toontown Transit would see themselves evolve into the opening day attraction of Storm Rider at Tokyo Disney Sea, 
and even the fireworks gag was reworked into the storm device crashing through the ceiling. Roller Coaster Rabbit would have been the first roller coaster at Disney MGM Studios, based on the Roger Rabbit short of the same name, which was released theatrically with Dick Tracy. The ride would have taken guests on an antics and special effects laden roller coaster with Roger Rabbit and Baby Herman. A major dark ride in the area would have been Baby Herman's Runaway Buggy Ride, a traditional Fantasyland style dark ride. Based on the Roger Rabbit short Tummy Trouble, guests would have boarded oversized baby buggies and raced through hospital rooms, clunked down stairs, and careened around beds, patients, and more in the Toontown Hospital. The attraction did see some public pushback though, with people complaining that there was nothing funny about a hospital, and creating this attraction would have been insensitive to both patients and doctors. The final attraction in the land would have been a dark ride aboard Benny the Cab, an experience that would ultimately see itself adapted into Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin, which would open at Disneyland in 1994 and Tokyo Disneyland in 1996. Ultimately, Roger Rabbit's Hollywood never made it off the drawing board for a few reasons. One of the major issues in getting the land approved was the split ownership of the characters between Disney and Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, who helped to finance the film. Disagreements arose over profits, character usage, funding, as well as the design of the land and attractions, and with Spielberg's affiliation with Universal, it became difficult to deal with contractual roadblocks at every step of the project. This partnered with the rising construction and development costs of Euro Disney would see this Disney Decade project shelved. Part of the funding for this entire land was reallocated to a brand new, non tuned Sunset Boulevard, anchored by the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, which would open in July of 1994. Disney's stance on Roger Rabbit became, why fight with Spielberg over control of Roger when they had a brand new slate of incredibly popular characters and films coming out as part of the Disney decade? Disney would try to create their own version of Roger Rabbit they would own entirely with Bonkers T. Bobcat, a toon Bobcat living in a real world, though the real world was also animated. Unlike the great juxtaposition of Roger Rabbit interacting in a live action world. A few Roger Rabbit references would survive in Disney MGM Studios though, with the Looney Bin Backlot Tour Exit Gift Shop featuring a number of Roger Rabbit references before it was removed to make way for Galaxy's Edge, as well as an office window for Eddie Valiant next to an office with a Roger Rabbit cutout in the blinds, as well as a Maroon Studios billboard still being visible today within Disney's Hollywood Studios. Today, elsewhere in Disney World, you can still find Roger Rabbit as a giant figure in the 1980s wing of Pop Century, as well as him being occasionally available for meet and greets for Easter and other special events. Though, unfortunately for those who grew up with and are begging for the return of Roger Rabbit, it seems for the current generation of guests, the question is no longer who framed Roger Rabbit, but instead, who is Roger Rabbit? From the home of all things theme parks, I'm Luke for review time. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing.